I'm not starting over. Uh, so uh, finally, uh, integrated pest management, which is uh, based upon a rationale of monitoring the mites and uh, what the with treatment thresholds uh, and an uh, economic level of uh, damage that can be uh, uh, given to any colony. I, you got me locked up here. Okay, here we go. Levi, why am I stuck? It's, it's locked. Not working? Mm -mm. There we go. Back up. Is that where you want it? Yeah, it keeps it working now. Yeah. Okay, uh, what is Varroa destructor? It's an ectoparasite of the honeybee. It's originally from Asia and it requires a host to live. So if you have a dead hive, you don't have Varroa in that hive. And if no, you don't have any bees, you don't have any Varroa. It was original, its original host was uh, Apis serrana, which is uh, a honeybee that's uh, in Asia. And those, uh, they co-evolved, the Varroa mite and, and Apis serrana evolved together over the millennia. And so the serrana developed techniques in order to uh, not be overrun and, and have the colonies die from uh, the infestation. The secondary um, <clears throat> host uh, is a naive host and it's Apis mellifera. Uh, the, the way they, that Apis uh, mellifera uh, came in contact uh, uh, was in, in the uh, 1940s, uh, the uh, colonies from Europe were moved to the east and they were, uh, the Varroa encountered uh, um, the, the um, Apis mellifera bee and it didn't co-evolve with uh, Varroa. And so it became, it, it, the, the, the Varroa uh, went into those colonies and now has spread. Uh, all this other stuff is uh, interesting, but it's gonna, eat up my five minutes. There are 14 different types of uh, Varroa variants and the top uh, on the left side is uh, Varroa destructor and below it is Varroa uh, Jacobsoni. And it turns out that only the Japanese and the Korean varieties cause, cause pathology. None of these others uh, 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 cause the damage that the Varroa does the Varroa destructor, I should say. Now, this is a distribution of Varroa destructor, even though it only, it started off, uh, it started off uh, in Asia, uh, Asia, Japan, Korea, in this area uh, to the right. Uh, the, the, it is now spread just about everywhere. And Australia is, is labeled here as not having uh, Varroa, but that's in question now. They did get an infestation not a couple of years ago, and uh, it's hard, hard to say that they were able to control it. In Africa, there are some uh, countries that don't measure it, don't know about it at all. So we, those are in white. Um, this is uh, important here. This is the biology of the mite as well as the mite the honeybee interaction. I'm just going to start at the uh, top where the ind individual bee is. Uh, mites will be riding along. Well, I don't, you know, there's the old question of which came first, the chicken or the egg. But at some point, given that this is a cycle, uh, you got to start somewhere. So we're going to start at the top. The mite rides on the adult bee uh, that's uh, foraging and it will transmit to other hives 
by either robbing, uh, swarming, or just simple drifting. Uh, what happens here is uh, the larva is, um, or the egg is laid, that uh, uh, um, hatches, and then a larva develops. Every time the larva gets bigger, it has to shed its, um, uh, uh, its envelope. And those are uh, called, um, you know, um, well, anyway, they, 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 they do that five times in, in larval development. And in the last stage is the fifth instar stage. Uh, the stages between the moltings uh, are called instars. Uh, you know about uh, pheromones and brood pheromone and how that uh, um, suppresses the um, uh, suppresses the uh, uh, the the nurse bee's ovaries. Well, it also tells the nurse bees various things during its life cycle. When it hits the fifth instar stage, then the the worker bees are alerted that they need to cap the the uh, uh, cap the cell with wax. But it also alerts the varroa mite that it's time to go in the cell. So the founders mite uh, will uh, go into the cell at the fifth instar and hide in the bottom in the brood food. Uh, once the, once the uh, uh, cell is capped over, she will uh, come out of the brood food and puncture the larva at the sixth inner space, uh, sixth segment, other places as well, but primarily in the sixth segment of development and start feeding on the fat bodies of the, of the larva. It should also uh, feed on the uh, uh, fat bodies of the develop, I'm sorry, once it's capped, it's a pupa. So it's a, the first off would be a larva, then pre-pupa, and finally a, a, a pupa. And <clears throat> at 70 hours, that uh, mother, uh, uh, mite or the foundress mite, as she's called, lays the first egg, and that first egg is a male egg. She does not you. It, they're haplodiploid, just like uh, honeybees. So the first egg is not fertilized. Then third, then that that turns into a male. The male um, uh, then develops and matures, while thirty hours later, the the uh, foundress lays the second egg but fertilizes that. So it, it's now uh, a female. So those are brother and sister. And then every 30 hours, she, the, the foundress lays another egg and she lays, you know, keeps laying and will lay in the time frame that the, the uh, pupa cell is capped up probably around five in the worker and even more in the uh, drone cell because workers' cells are capped for 12 days, whereas the drone cells are capped 15 days. That, that's why, the, or it, teleologically, that's why the, uh, uh, the mites prefer to go into drone, uh, drone comb. Uh, these are the stages here. Uh, an adult male uh, is at five to six days. Adult uh, female is 4.5 days. Um, so the the brother and sister mate, a uh, little incest there, and uh, that be, that happens in the cell, and then over the course of time, uh, the um, the new mites will emerge. Once the capping is taken off, if the uh, female uh, mites uh, haven't matured, they will have to be, um, they will die basically by the uncapped. <clears throat> uh, the foundress starts with 35 uh, sperm spermatozoa. So when the, br the brother and sister mate, they, she gets 30, around 35, and that's all that she's got uh, for her life. And when she runs out, She's become sterile. Uh, these are the stages of the uh, mite development. On the left, we have the, the male uh, larva. 
And then it goes through uh, two stages called the deuteronymph uh, and uh, what's the other one? The, uh, there's another stage as well. And then they uh, end up uh, as adults. Uh, here's the, uh, the male, 6.5 days, and the female, uh, 4.5 days. And here's the, the process in, in, in a linear uh, fashion. So the founders goes in 70, day, 70 hours, first egg is laid. That is the male develops to this stage. Another 30 hours, the second egg becomes a female. They go on and mate uh, around uh, day 11 uh, and so forth and so on. Because of the length of time of a worker, uh, cap worker cell, uh, she, she, you only get 1.2 uh, new mites from that. This shows two, two, mite, two daughter mites and the mother uh, coming out. But due to various factors, uh, she may only uh, produce 1.2 on average in a worker cell. In a drone cell, uh, she, uh, it's 14 days. I said 15 earlier, but 14 days. Uh, she can produce two to three fertile adult female mites. So one to two in the uh, worker cell, two to three in the drone cell. The term fecundity has to do with what's possible and what's actual. So that's where the 1.2 uh, and the 2.2 four uh, numbers come from. And uh, this is just a reworking. The queen lays the egg, uh, the development occurs, the mother enters, the mother uh, mite enters the cell. And in the drone, uh, you get can get three coming out. In the worker, you get one. And the queen isn't uh, capped long enough to produce any mites. So uh, that's the story. What are the consequences to the bees? Well, the varroa destructor feeds on the larva and the pupa fat bodies. That weakens the individual beads and uh, infects them with viruses. This hole that is that they produce put into the uh, abdomen and, and uh, sixth uh, space of the larva <clears throat> is not the normal way that viruses are tra transmitted. They are normally through oral feeding but this uh, causes a, a, like a hypodermic effect where they can directly inject the viruses into the bee's body. Um, lowers immunity and decreases the lifespan. Uh, it weakens the colony and that uh, leads to the concept of an e economic threshold. What's the economic threshold? Uh, the pest density at which damage is done So the pest density at which management action should be taken to prevent an increasing pest population from reaching the economic injury level where the colony will die. And so here's uh, a normal V Varroa idealized uh, graph. Uh, in yellow is B population, in red is Varroa population over the course of the year. This is, this is uh, at the peak is, you know, uh, uh, probably around July or August. And when they, when the queen uh, slows down laying, you've got all of that cat brood, the varroa keep, keep coming out uh, of the cells. And if you get too much infestation, uh, you, you kind of doomed or the hot of the colony is. And so, I got a couple more slides, that's it. So this is the treatment threshold, uh, 1%, 2%, 3%. And uh, these are the things you can do. It's called the uh, integrated pest management. Um, and these are the options for chemical treatment. <laughs> Here. 
Okay, at this point, we're going to segue to our panelists, each giving a quick description of how they monitor and test for mites, and then we're going to open it up to questions from all of you. On in. Okay, Peter, since you're here, why don't oh. you launch us off with... So what? Oh, oh. kind of keep it. Yeah, uh, can you go over? Tell me where to... Yeah. It's like over there, so hold that for a Hmm. Yep, Elizabeth, you online and ready? I'm here. Cool. I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks, Elizabeth. So to start off the panel, we're going to start with a short, like two minutes each on what we do to treat. And then after that, we'll start taking questions and you'll tend to hear opinions from each of us. Oh yeah, not just treating, but monitoring as well. So Bob, do you want to kick us off? Okay, Bob's going to go last. Peter, you want to go first? So first of all, I do not do alcohol wash. I don't kill my bees. I understand that that might be a controversial behavior, but I can't do it, so I don't. I use the screen bottom boards, and I look on the trays, and if I see mites, then I know I have to treat. And uh, the treatment that I use is based on a chemical named Amatraz. When the bees first came to the United States in 1987 and then in the 90s, they pretty much wiped out all the commercial beekeepers. And somebody discovered that this chemical amitraz, which is used to kill ticks on cattle, would also control varroa mites. Uh, they couldn't use it legally, of course, because it wasn't approved. But what else were they going to do? And it saved them. Today, the product that uses that chemical is called Apovar. And I use that when the honey supers are not on. When the honey supers are on, I use Randy Oliver's method of paper towels with oxalic acid and glycerin. Elizabeth, do you want to go next? Sure. Can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. Awesome. So I'm here with my little model Varroa. Um, I am not a treater, but I always like beginners to know that that doesn't mean that you should ignore throw, pretend they don't exist. Um, I like to recommend for beginners that they try the uh, powdered sugar roll for monitoring. I think that's a little easier for beginners um, than trying to figure it out from um, looking at the monitoring boards, which is uh, a good technique if you're more experienced. Um, and I think sometimes the sugar roll, while it isn't quite as accurate as the uh, alcohol wash, it's kind of a good compromise. It's, it's good enough um, and kind of gets people past that idea of uh, feeling bad that they have to, you know, kill a bunch of bees. So I do recommend that people monitor, um, usually starting in June, if they haven't done it already, you can get a great little kit from Man Lake or at the feed store to do the testing with and find out what your mite count is per 100 bees. Um, yeah, and there's uh, lots of ways to control mites without treating, including getting um, resistant stock, um, to feeding drone brood uh, to chickens or sticking it in the freezer, um, because as uh, Bob was saying, that's where most of the mites come from. So if you call out drone brood, especially in your second year, it's hard to do that as a first year beekeeper. Um, that's really helpful. Uh, my Bees also tend to get a lot of brood breaks because I do a lot of natural splits and reproduction in my hive. So they have a period of being broodless because um, I give them a whole month undisturbed um, when they're requeening so that they can just requeen naturally. And uh, that gives them a little bit of a break from the mites as well. And uh, honestly, some of it is just kind of being, um, being aware and being, um, I guess a little bit philosophical because uh, even the experts who treat all the time often lose half of their bees. I think it's just something that people have to um, 
really understand as beginners so that they're not taken by surprise in the fall in there. And I really take Tori's point also that, you know, um, I'm friends with everybody on this panel here. We are all go way back and, you know, there's no reason why everyone can't be nice and civil about everything and uh, understand each other's perspective and learn from each other. How dare you say we're civil? <laughs> well, except for you, of course. Yeah. Um, so my two minutes <laughs> is that I also do a sugar roll. Um, and aside from the sugar roll, I also just observe the bees. Um, if I see them like crawling on the ground more than usual, that's usually like, eh, they probably have a problem. I should do another sugar roll. And lo and behold, they're infested. Um, I don't really use the bottom board sticky board. I have trays under mine, but they get gummed up with everything under the sun. So it's not reliable enough for me, um, but that's because of the stupid trays I have. Um, aside from that, I've treated with Formic Pro, oxalic acid vaporization and oxalic acid extended release towels. Uh, I've done the sweetest sponges like what Randy Oliver talks about doing. Um, I've used a wand type vaporizer and I've used the like gun style vaporizer uh yeah I've that's about all I've got to say I really like the sugar roll for the same reasons that Elizabeth said right it doesn't kill the bees and it's good enough because if there's more than like four or five or whatever then yeah time to treat I don't have to kill you know 100 300 bees to know when it's time to treat because I'm not doing science I'm not writing down my measurements I'm just making it easy to make decision Bob, you ready? So I think the uh, comment about uh, ob observing your hive and watching for signs is a, a very good one. Um, there have been times when I uh, haven't done anything and I'll look on the ground and see uh, 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 bees that have deformed wings. And that is a, a clear sign that there's a varroa infestation. Uh, and the deformed wing virus has been in, uh, being injected in the colony is uh, uh, infested not only with uh, mites, but with the foreign, deformed wing virus, as well as other viruses. Um, I started out with uh, benign neglect when I first started, and I pulled out a, uh, a bottom board a monitoring tray at, at one point and brought it in and there was a, a, a Tom Verkuter, a member of the club. Uh, I showed him the photo. I only had 138 mites on the board. So the, Tom looked at me and said, hmm, you've got a problem, which is true. That hive died the, the following uh, spring. Um, it's, uh, I mean, what's, what's worse, uh, um, not treating your high, your uh, colonies that are infested with mite or, you know, killing a few bees, finding out what the uh, infestation level is and uh, proceeding with some sort of mitigation so the bees aren't suffering from uh, varro varroaosis, as it's called. Um, lately, I uh, treat early in the spring. Um, February, March, very early uh, to keep the initial numbers down. I treat with um, with Formic Pro. I will use, uh, I will follow the directions, which are that you have to have six frames of uh, uh, bees in order to use it. And there are temperature uh, ranges. Uh, I think it's 55 to 85, um, uh, otherwise, either not enough evaporates into the hive or too much too quickly. Um, I do uh, monitor uh, with, uh, I have have used the uh, sugar roll. Uh, the bees don't uh, die, but it's a little bit uh, uh, clunky, I would say, and not all the mites are gonna fall off with the sugar roll. Uh, I've used uh, alcohol wash a couple times. Uh, get lots of, of mites uh, clearly uh, falling down in, from that. And then Randy Oliver just did a workshop uh, for us and he has he uses Dawn soap, uh, which really causes uh, the mites to fall off. 
and he's got a couple of uh, uh, Dick, uh, what are they called, Dixie cups or uh, the solo cups uh, that he has a, a made it a very easy to make um, devices that uh, he fills up to a, a two and three quarter inches with uh, the the Dawn soap. It's uh, formula is uh, two tablespoons of Dawn to a gallon of water. So uh, you get a whole thing, it's not too sudsy and uh, it does kill bees. So uh, a scoop of uh, bees, a, a half a cup of bees is about 300 bees. And then you just divide the number of mites that fall um, that you can, can count and you'll get your percentage of mites per, bee, per 100 bees. Um, so, so that's about, that's it for me. Sorry. Yep, so questions from either the library or on Zoom. We're also monitoring Zoom chat. So feel free to ask the group a question, a particular person a question. We're full of opinions and they're very strong and we want you to hear them. We had a question from in the library about how to perform the same operation that Randy Oliver has. Uh, he has it detailed on his website, but Bob explained it verbally uh, to the person in the audience. Uh, I'm gonna go down chat. Uh, Tiffany Craig asks, is there any treatment preference? Um, I kind of joked, we, we have opinions and we want you to hear them. Uh, there are pros and cons. I'll try to take a, a, what is it, a fence sitting approach here. There are pros and cons to every form of treatment, even going like, quote, untreated, where you take like brood breaks, where I would argue that's more of a natural treatment. You are doing something to affect it. Therefore, in my opinion, it's a treatment. Um, brood breaks, caging the queen, things like that. There's soft chemicals or organic chemicals, which would be oxalic acid, formic acid, those sorts of things where it's a acid found in nature, but you're just dumping a whole ton of it into the hive at once. And then there's the harder chemicals like Apivar, Apistan, those sorts of things. Um, there is no preference in my opinion. Like it's up to each individual beekeeper to decide for themselves. I mean, hell, some people don't get the flu vaccine or the COVID vaccine or any vaccines on their kids for that matter. I mean, that's up to them, right? Uh, Peter's got something to say. But it may not be a good <laughs> So I, I mentioned that I use Apivar to, to treat for mites, but I should add that in the last three years or so, I've caught swarms, one from a shed in Palo Alto, one from a friend who I caught her bees years ago and found that she had never treated them. And so I insisted that she give me a swarm and I have not treated those bees for three years either. And they're still alive. Uh, and I have a couple of other hives from feral colonies. And I, if, if the bees come from a feral colony and not from a commercial beekeeper, I give them a chance to go treatment free. And if they don't show that they have a lot of mites, I continue to not treat. I guess I should mention that uh, this, uh, in addition to Formic Pro, I've used oxalic acid um, extended release, and I've also used vaporization, oxalic acid vaporization. Uh, I prefer the vaporization, although, um, it's very time consuming because it does the oxalic acid does not penetrate wax. So uh, the developing mites are protected from it. And so you have to uh, catch them when they're riding outside. Uh, so that takes about anywhere from four to five treatments, uh, depending on how you do it. Um, some people only do three, they do them every seven days. 
to get into the um, 14 day time span that the uh, drone cappings are allowing the mites and the, uh, the, the drone to develop under the cap. Can I jump in, Levi? Yep, I was about to call on you since we've all had a turn. Your turn. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, I think one thing to bear in mind when you're choosing a treatment um, is you always want to be really careful about reading all the directions and following all of the safety guidelines on them. Um, I usually, for beginners, if they want to treat, I recommend they go with one of the, the softer um, honey safe treatments. Um, because I find that often um, beginners make mistakes, they leave the treatment in too long, and then they have their honey supers on, or they kind of take the whole thing about the honey, honey supers a little too literally, and they don't understand that if they have treated, but they had six frames of honey in their deeps, that honey got treated by that treatment, even though it wasn't in the supers. And so then that creates questions later as to what is safe for them to extract and eat and what isn't. And uh, my take is always that, um, you know, it's all it's always a tragedy when we lose a colony, especially when we're beginners, but I would so much rather that your bees died of mites than you or someone in your family um, got sick or hurt from uh, an improperly applied treatment. Okay, uh, before we jump to the next one, I'm going to make one more comment, and that's for Tiffany or anyone else as part of this conversation. I've posted to the Guild before a spreadsheet I made that lists every treatment that I could find as of about a year ago, whether or not they're approved or legal in California, whether or not they're honey safe, and therefore to help people answer a similar question to Tiffany, what is the treatment preference? Um, I'll try to make another post that links to that spreadsheet again, that will list off, you can help make a more informed decision on your own. There is no single best answer to that question. The next question is from Lynn. Does any of the treatment residue stay in the brood chamber wax? Um, I'm going to give my opinion and pass it around. I think that was a great format, so I'd like to do that again. Um, I'm going to say yes, but it varies on the chemical. Um, this is one of the reasons I personally use the soft chemicals because those do not stay in the wax, but some of the harder chemicals do. And there's this is a budding area of research where it's new research is coming out every couple months about this exact thing. So I don't I have not added that to like my spreadsheet and I don't know you'd have to literally look up each scientific article on, you know, which one does and doesn't. But if you want to be extra cautious, I would use the safe, the organic chemicals like formic acid or oxalic acid, or go with the more natural, like caging your queen. Peter? Or Bob? So I can say for certain that the Apivar does not stay in the wax of your honey super because your honey super is not on when you applied it. And it has, yeah, so I have no idea if it stays in that wax or not, but I should mention that the chemical in Apivar, Amitraz, is also used to make animal tick collars. And so if your dog is still alive, there's mm -hmm. some hope that you will still be alive too. Didn't Oliver send a piece of wax that he treated with that bar off to get checked? And after like three months, there was nothing like, yeah, I should probably be talking. I should probably be talking in the microphone. Um, if my memory's right, one of our members sent off a piece of wax that he had treated multiple times with Apivar. And the lab he sent it to could not find any traces of it after, I think it was like three months since the last treatment. Um, that's all anecdotal. I don't have any scientific articles to link to, but anecdotally, some of the chemicals will stay in wax, some won't. I'll pass it back to Bob. Yeah, I'm. if I could get my slides back here. Um, so yeah, the, the uh, naturally occurring chemicals like formic pro uh, or formic acid 
which ants use as a defense mechanism, and uh, oxalic acid, which is uh, in oxalis flowers and uh, spinach and many other foods we eat, uh, don't accumulate in the wax. Um, and if even if they did, they're, uh, they're naturally occurring and uh, don't, uh, uh, in, they're not in high enough quantities uh, to cause any harm to humans. The other, there's actually two other uh, treatments uh, that are considered uh, natural. One is thymol uh, or thymol, and um, it, it's, it's used primarily because it stinks so much uh, with honey supers off. Um, and then the, the other one is that, that one's um, uh, called Abregard. It comes in a tin and, and the bees have to walk over it and to spread it around. And finally, Ape of Our Life, which is a, a thymol and eucalyptus uh, oil mixture. Um, and it's, a, well, there's Apistan, there's Kumafos. Yeah, these, those aren't even really available anymore because they, yeah, it's, it leaves, <laughs> the mites have developed resistance to it, but they haven't reason that I'm aware of. Uh, I think the Apivar, they're starting to find resistant mites. Um, but the others, uh, they, the, the organic acids like uh, uh, formic and oxalic, the mechanisms that they uh, are using to kill the mites, um, apparently, um, don't, um, they can't re develop resistance to those two uh, acids because it's like burning their feet, foot pads and uh, causing other disruptions in the mites. But the levels that are uh, used in the hive aren't affecting the bees um, per se. And you know, your honeybee, your uh, worker bees are only alive for six weeks. Um, uh, you you have to be kind of very careful about uh, injuring your queens though. Um, so I don't believe that, uh, uh, oh, there is a, uh, your Apivar uh, uh, Amitraz, it, it's used in other countries as a tablet that you light on fire and it's a fume, it fumigates the hive. Using that technique, there's a new article I just read that you do find residue in the wax, but not with the ape of our treatment, which is a, a, a plastic uh, uh, sheet that the, the bees walk over to get the uh, substance on it. So you can actually buy Amitraz directly on the internet. It helps if you read Cyrillic. <laughs> All right. Oh, sure thing. All right, Elizabeth, you want, you're up next. Oh, on the same topic? I didn't hear the yes. question. Uh, do any of the treatment residues stay in the brood chamber wax? Yeah, I don't think I have anything to add to that. Just um, my understanding is also that um, the old school ones may be used to, but not so much uh, the ones that are currently used as they're not really terribly lipid soluble. And I would just um, reiterate that I think the, the biggest concern for, for beginners is always to be just really careful with your application and thoroughly read the and follow the directions, um, especially things like um, a lot of people run into trouble using expired formic, um, which actually doesn't make it less effective. It makes it stronger because it's the thing that expires is the slow release mechanism and they can end up killing their queen um, or using formic um, when things maybe finally actually heat up in the summer um, and it's beyond the temperature scope in there. So I would just always say, just really carefully read those directions and keep yourself safe. 
uh, Randy Oliver showed us a, a method of not blasting your uh, bees with Formic Pro because when you open that package and put it on a, in a hive, the first day you get a big, huge blast of uh, Formic Acid. So what he's figured out uh, is that if you take the wrapper, the or say a, uh, I used uh, Ziploc uh, sandwich bags, and you put that on top of the uh, the the strip, and then push the uh, push down on that. Uh, it only allows the formic pro or formic acid to uh, fume out uh, to release from one side of the strip. Uh, it traps the acid on the on the other side on the side that you put the barrier on. And so that first day doesn't get a, a huge uh, release of uh, formic uh, into the colony. And according to Randy, um, uh, you will not lose queens if you do it that way. That's cool. Does he remove it after the first day or he leaves it the whole time? He leaves it the whole time. Interesting. And that uh, that one that you light on fire sounds amazing, but uh, definitely not something we want in California. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Next question is from David Axelrod. If you monitor with the screen bottom sticky board method, are you looking for an absolute number of mites or a relative amount for your particular hive? Um, I'll take a swing at this first. And I would say use, think about it for a moment. If you've got a single deep brood box with only three frames of bees and you get three mites, maybe that's not a problem. If you've got a double deep and honey super is on and your colony's huge and you get three mites, that's not really a problem at all. So I would say it's not an absolute number. It's relative for the hive itself. Uh, just think about the population of your hive. Exactly. Like if you want to get scientific about it, it's you're trying to estimate the number of mites in the colony based on the number that are dropping. And you kind of have to know the size of your colony to figure that out. But also bear in mind that that sticky board, like, did you put it in for exactly 24 hours? Did you forget about it for a day? And now it's been 48 hours because now you're going to have double the amount of mites on. it. So you kind of got to approach it from like a scientific angle. Make sure that you're counting based on the size of your hive. And then. So Tori from in the library room just said she agrees with what I said and takes into account how much trash is on the board that will tell you how many frames are being used for brood based on how many are being chewed open to help you get a accurate count of how many bees are in the hive. Is that accurate? Okay. Peter? This is embarrassing. I, I don't have an answer. If there's two mites on the first, first of all, my my sticky boards are not sticky at all. They're just boards, and I use an apivar, a spent apivar thing to scrape them off every time I do an inspection. So I get a fresh mite count, and you know I would say if I saw seven mites, then I would probably treat, but uh, it's not scientific at all. My boards are too dirty to count mites. <laughs> Elizabeth, you want to add to that? Yeah, I think what Bob has to, had to say there was really kind of on target. A lot of people, especially beginners, you know, when I go to visit the and pull out the inspection board is hard to get out. It's so full of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, you definitely need to, if you're going to use that, make sure that you're doing it for 24 hours. You're really checking it. And I think it's something that, you know, as Tori was talking about, that you, you would get a feel for and you would um, learn to understand as you gained experience. Um, I think one thing that could be really helpful is if you're a beginner and you're wanting to get that skill is maybe for your first year or two, um, look at your inspection board, maybe even take a picture of it, then do your sugar roll and compare. 
and you know mark write this down in your notebook and you know write down how many frames of brood you think you had and what the results were and then i think you're going to kind of train up your eye and train up your experience um, so that you become a better beekeeper over time it's hard at first i want to repeat something that bob said that i think is relevant if you see bees walking around on the ground near your hive and you get down on your hands and knees and look at them and their wings are not in a standard configuration or if you see bees that appear to have four wings instead of two, that's the K-wing virus, or if they are running around in circles and can't seem to control their body movements, that's the Israeli paralysis virus. And you don't need to look at your sticky board after that. You, you have mites and you have to treat straight away. Okay, next question. Well, before I answer another question from the chat, did we have any from the library? I don't mean to ignore you all with my back to you. Yeah, come on up. Ah, question from the library is, what is a sugar roll? Um, it was answered, but just for everyone on Zoom, I, I can answer that. I don't think we'll have to pass it around. Essentially, you take a measured amount of bees. It, I think it's like a half a cup or a cup, Bob, half a cup. It's about 300 bees. Put them in a mason jar with a screened lid and a bunch of powdered sugar. I use the end of my uh, hive tool and just dump in. It's probably about a tablespoon and a half, two tablespoons and then give them a nice rolling around, give them not too violent of a shake. I mean, cause I don't want to kill them, but I want to knock off any Varroa. And then after you get them fully saturated for a little bit, turn it over on like a white, I use a tub, but anything white, and then you shake it out and the powdered sugar will be white. So, you know, whatever, but then the Varroa will be little red dots that some of them will still be trying to move around. And then you count them up. Oh. That's a good one too. Bob just mentioned you can use the, a spray bottle filled with just normal water. Uh, after you dump, after you shake out the mason jar into your white tub, spray the tub with water and it'll dissolve the powdered sugar. So and the only thing that'll be left are like little pieces of dirt or whatever and varroa mites. Not on that. Okay. Any other questions from the library? Can I just add to that? Um, it's important that the bees be from the uh, brood frames is where you want to target them from and not get your queen. Um, but uh, there's there's great resources online. You can watch a video to see how to do this. And I, I do recommend that there's a nice little kit from Man Lake if you don't want to build your own. Yeah, I agree with the kit thing. I got mine from the uh, feed store here in Redwood City. It's like University of some states bee kit and it came with you know ev literally everything you need including the spray bottle the spray bottle was a piece of junk i bought a different one but everything else <laughs> i mean i looked on like amazon how much is a screened lid for a mason jar it was almost the cost of the whole kit i don't know why it was so expensive when i looked on amazon unless i wanted to buy like 100 of them so i just bought the kit but if anyone wants a piece of one eighth screen to make their own um just shoot me an email and i'll give you a piece i've got tons of it Okay. Hang on one second. We're going. So this talk has been primarily hard chemicals and soft chemicals, but there's a whole uh, list of other things that are physical or cultural that can be done. Um, if you're not wanting to treat with chemicals uh, at the cultural level, there's uh, getting que uh, queens that are resistant to varroa mite that's that's right now is not really that much that available to get those kinds of queens but hopefully the the bee producing industry is working on uh producing queens that can handle uh mites on their own another thing is um uh giving them a brood break that was talked about that's not a chemical thing you trap the queen and then she can't go laying and then all the uh, cells open up and uh, and all the mites and everything come out and then uh, you you could 
uh, treat with, say, um, a, an oxalic acid vapor and kill most of them in one shot. Um, other things uh, we're talking about mite trapping. That's you, you can, there are uh, uh, lime green frames that deep frames that have uh, uh, drone brood size cells and they produce the, the queen will just lay drones in there. Uh, this is very uh, sort of important to uh, keep an eye on because if you don't get those out of what happens, they, the queen lays all these drones, they get all capped and then you pull that out and put them in the freezer and you kill all those drones as well as uh, the mites that are in there with them. Uh, it's important not to let them start hatching out, uh, be, otherwise you're creating an infestation in your hive. Um, uh, and that, you know, those are other things that can, can be done besides chemicals. I think Alla would uh, say that she doesn't treat, but uh, these are things that she does to keep her, oh, and doing splits, like Elizabeth said, uh, the half that doesn't have a queen is getting a brood break. The other half, you still have to keep an eye on because they don't get a, a brood break. They have their original queen. Um, yeah, so that's that's about all I wanted to say is that you don't have to use chemicals, although some people think that you do if your other methods don't keep your economic threshold level down. I wasn't able to show that. But any, if you go to Honey Bee Health Coalition and it's on the bibliography that I'm going to put up, uh, they have videos on all of this stuff. Um, Can I add one other thing, Levi? Yeah, go ahead, Elizabeth. Then after Elizabeth, we've got two questions that we've got about eight minutes to run through. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, so I, this isn't specifically a mite management thing, but it basically is a way of dealing with the high mortality from mites because even like I say, professionals um, who are treating often lose half of their hives. So what I really recommend doing is um, doing a split of your bees. Um, if you're first year, then that split needs to happen probably in the latter half of the year. If you're going into your second year, you're maybe splitting early anyhow to uh, prevent swarming and go into the fall with twice as many hives as you want to have next February. Now it doesn't always work out. Um, and sometimes you have more hives than you wanted or sometimes you have none. Um, but if everybody did that, then in February, those who had extra bees could swap them over to those who needed bees. And um, you really wouldn't need to order as many bees in. Um, just as kind of a more of a idea of the sustainable apiary. Back up your bees. Excellent point, Elizabeth. That's why I personally always tell people to have a minimum two hives. If they, whenever anyone says, I only have one hive, get a second one. Uh, I said we had two questions left and we want to finish up by 810. So the next question is, does everyone just go ahead and treat before August rather than keep monitoring? I'm going to just say it's probably a, I don't know, my opinion, personal opinion, it's not a good idea to treat willy-nilly unless there is a problem. Uh, to put it into better context, you don't just take antibiotics because you might get a sinus infection this winter. It's essentially the same thing. We don't want the mites to build up a resistance to any of the chemicals that we use, and we don't want to stress out our bees with treatments if we don't have to. So it's better to only treat when you need to. That said, if you're not, if you're a beginner and you're not great at understanding if you need to treat or not, you're a beginner, go ahead and just throw some Formic Pro on there in August, assuming it's cold enough or oxalic or something. Um, worst case scenario, you stress out your bees. Well, worst case scenario, you kill your queen and then they requeen, but you could save your hive if you don't understand how to assess whether or not you need it. Uh, other questions? Can you, uh, I don't think she can hear me. <laughs> Elizabeth, do you have anything to add there? Bob and Peter don't. Um, 
Not really. I would just go ahead, go ahead with the idea of, you know, that that kit from Man Lake or the feed store is very easy to use. And if you do some testing as you're going along, even if you haven't decided if you're going to treat or not, you're going to learn a lot about how um, the mite cycle of the year works. And that is also going to make you a better beekeeper and have a better understanding of what's going on. Okay, last question is, should you alternate treatment types, two enough or more? Uh, there's a lot of research that says that we should definitely not use the same hard chemicals over and over again, because that's how you breed uh, resistance to that particular chemical. So that's where the idea of shifting chemicals, uh, I feel this is more applicable to the hard chemicals. However, from the science I've read, it's not bulletproof. Like if you use Formic Pro always, they can never get a resistance to it. We don't know that. Uh, evolution is funny and we don't fully understand it all the time. And nothing says that Varroa couldn't build thicker skin to prevent their feet being burned off by Formic. So as of right now, yes, alternate treatment. Uh, two should be fine, assuming you do two, two treatments a year that's enough apart in the mite life cycle where they shouldn't hopefully be able to build a resistance to it. I personally do two different treatments each year. I think, I think somebody, uh, scientific beekeeping, Randy would disagree with you wholeheartedly. Probably. And uh, he would say, uh, treat by monitoring because they're doing four and five treatments a year in his in his group of there, they're all being rotated. Let's take this question here. So my question is for the Dawn treatment, how many mites are you looking for once you lift up the solo cups and you're, they're at the bottom? There's no change in your indicators, okay? There's, that's the economic threshold is determined by how many mites fall. Uh, it, it, no, it's it, if I could get my uh, get back on with my share screen. I think it's less than three, so yeah, three mics per hundred. So that's more than so yeah, three hundred bees. That would be six mics. More than you check the scientific bee keeping website, Hill Valley, and also the Honey Bee, bee Health Coalition. Right, let me. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we realized we weren't speaking into the mic. The question was, how many mites is a worrying number in a sugar roll or an alcohol wash or whatever? And we're, Bob is working on pulling up the exact number, but it's essentially a percentage of your bee population. We think it's, and the time of year, not just a percent of bee population. Can you repeat that for the people online? It depends on the mite numbers and the time of year. Because as in the spring, your queen's laying eggs like crazy, you're building up, and then she stops around, you know, uh, and, the, and then you get into a dormant uh, period. So it really depends on what period you're in. And I have that information here on my uh, talk, but I can't. This is it. Start slideshow and then Here's the bibliography. Uh, if you want to do a screenshot, this is, uh, I got so much stuff in front of it. Uh, what, well, that's just in R. I know it's the things that only people in the room and they can't read it. Okay. Are you going to send this to the whole group on the? Uh, I guess it could go. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's uh, the next page is also. Sure, we just take a Tap in here, like click your mouse in here. 
there you go. That's the whole sheet. That's the end of the sheet. Okay. Here's a, this is a first page of the bibliography. Um, if you want to do your screenshots, you want to take a picture again? No? Okay. And then um, here are the thresholds. Uh, so the uh, I need to go one back one more. We talked so on the uh, I we talked before about the uh, yellow curve being the number of bees, uh, the red curve being the number of mites. Uh, there's a dormant phase, an increasing phase. Uh, a stable phase, and a decreasing, and then again, dormant phase. And based on those phases, the, there are acceptable levels, cautious levels, and dangerous levels. And if you're above uh, 3%, uh, you're, or, which is you know nine mites or around that area, you, you really have a problem. Uh, and that would be during the dormant or population increase level. Uh, the peak population and uh, population decrease levels have different. So it, it's important to know what, what phase you're in uh, w when you are uh, interpreting your sample findings. And all of this, all you'd have to do is Google mite treatment, you know, IPM mite treatment or honeybee health coalition. Um, the there there are multiple uh, sites that have all of this information here's the these are the, all the chemicals and then this um second reference on this bibliography is the honeybee health coalition it's a, a, a front page and then if you scroll down on the page it's got all the videos all the information that you could uh can find or uh, it's more than I want to know. Can I uh, add one little thing? Uh, yes, and then that's going to be the last thing. We're going to get kicked out of the library soon. Okay, so the um, the tables that are talking about at different um, stages in the hive kind of uh, yearly life cycle, some of them are talking about dormant without brood. And that's one of those things you have to remember that in California, we don't usually do dormant without brood. We basically always have some brood in the colony. Great point, Elizabeth. Yeah, not all of California, but the Bay Area, like our county, definitely. Yeah, sorry, have sorry. A break. Yes, we always have, it's warm enough. Sorry, there was a question in the library, is that due to weather? Short answer, yes. Uh, we always have it being warm enough and something is always blooming. So they don't have to spend all of their energy conserving, keeping the hive warm and they can go get food. We, that's the same reason we don't have to feed during winter here. Whereas in you know Wisconsin, you're gonna have to feed them over the winter. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining. If you're on Zoom, I'm going to close out the Zoom. Uh, I'll post the recording to YouTube as usual. Uh, I already posted my Levi's Varroa spreadsheet to the Guild, and Bob, I believe he said he's going to post his wonderful presentation on the Guild as well, so you can get all of that info. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And if you're in the library, we do have some medium frames to raffle off. I believe everyone has raffle tickets, so stick around if you want some medium frames. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Elizabeth.